projects on uh, uh, international community development in the army who is a development involvement and uh, he's going to be able to uh, go through a, a series of slides. There's a bunch of pictures that were put together of this project where we're uh, helping with this process. Uh, Jeremy said, I'll give the overview. He will take care of it. So I'll just turn it over to Jeremy. We're grateful that your uh, work you're doing. Uh, if anybody wants to see the progress report from the it was incredible, and that's the reason why we're uh, giving Jeremy the uh, time to uh, show what's happening. Uh, so, Jeremy, uh, all yours in a little bit. Okay, great. I'm not sure if everybody can hear me, or if, uh, but greetings from Zimbabwe. It's a, it's a long ways away here, so uh, your morning, my, uh, my, my evening. Yes, we can hear you. All right, great. Um, so a little bit of background on this project. Um, this, this is a project now that's been in, uh, was launched back in 2020 um, or at the very beginning of it all. So uh, this has been struggling through COVID the whole, the whole time, but the team on the ground, the South Africa team, many of you, some of you may have met some of them. Um, if you remember, Anne-Marie uh, Mostert came over, Charlotte uh, came over, visited our club. This is back in 2019. Um, so they are still leading this club. In fact, I think Charlotte is the uh, president-elect of the club. So she, she is uh, taking over soon. Um, but this project started with in different phases. The first phase was back in 2018 or 19, we did a medical pod. So our primary Rotarian on the ground here is Dr. Eleanor. She's been working in this community, just to put a little background to this community. We can probably just look at the next slide, but the background to the community is... Um, and this is a, a community that's called a displacement camp. It means that they are uh, kind of squatters, essentially, uh, sitting on undesignated land. So nothing permanently can be built. And people are coming here for better opportunity, um, primarily economic opportunity. So a lot of immigrants, uh, but some even, some even uh, locals as well. Um, and so th this, this particular site has now up to 80,000 people living there. There is no electricity, no plumbing, no water. Uh, no, no infrastructure, no schools, like go down the list of all the things that it doesn't have and it doesn't have it. And so um, Eleanor works at the University of Pretoria. And so their, their team had been working there for a number of years and she had been meeting, doing community health clinic uh, visits uh, with under patients under a tree. And uh, we, we at Matter decided to equip a, a medical uh, ship, a shipping container converted into a medical office. Mm -hmm. So it has an exam room, a procedure room, uh, a file room, and a dentist lab in this. And so our club sponsored the, the shipping and the logistics costs of bringing that there. So that was the first thing, the first thing that was on this site. Um, and it worked out so well that um, we decided to do another follow-up grant, a phase two grant, and that's what's being reported on today. So this one focuses primarily on nutrition, early childhood development, and trainings. So as you can see in this slide, uh, here's some of the team. Um, you can, some of you will recognize those names. Vice President is Hans Monstert, that's, that's Anne-Marie's husband. And then President-elect Charlotte, she visited our club as well. Uh, Carolyn, we all we know all these people, and they're an amazing group of, of, of Rotarians doing a lot of work here. So we can go to the next one. Uh, there was an HIV AIDS day, so the World HIV AIDS Day was a uh, uh, prevention day was was December first. So they did a pop up training and clinic that day, and in fact. Um, I think they said that, uh, I'm reading the report now, a total of 35 health professionals represented from a variety of organizations worked in the community in various nutritional educational sessions that day. So it was, it was Rotary brought together uh, 35 other health professionals from, from a variety of organizations. And now they actually have a place to work and gather when before there was nothing but a, a, a tree in a field. So we should feel proud about ourselves and getting this kicked off. And now it's being used for a lot of good. Uh, next slide. Ah, so yes, this is part of the early childhood development uh, training. So this is the community. Let me just find that in the report here. Um, there were 16 teachers from 15 early learning centers that have popped up in Malusi as a result of our, us being there. So again, this 
um, squatter camp of 80,000 people. There are now 15 early childhood learning centers that have popped up. Uh, these were mostly people just being kind of daycare uh, um, um, ladies. And so we decided that the purpose of this grant was to train them and go through a certificate program that was offered by and kind of credited by the University of Pretoria so that they would become early childhood uh, development specialists. And so that's been going on here for the last two years and they just had a graduation, their first one. So 16 teachers from all 15 of their early childhood learning centers just graduated last month or actually in December. So that's fantastic. Um, in, in the clinic themselves, uh, what they're doing a lot of here is record keeping. The kids again are coming from displacement communities. They often don't know their, uh, don't have no ID. They have no paperwork. They cross the borders illegally. Uh, so they have no, uh, no identification. They're not in any schools. So this is where part of this is of this program is simply the data collection. So we have an, a better idea of who's living in this community and what the needs are. Next one. Uh, so yes, that's a fancy word for we're doing, we're, we're, we're doing a lot of BMI and, and physical testing, body mass index, basically recording how is the child, how are the children um, comparing against the, 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 the world averages and, and, the, and the national averages in terms of growth. And um, that, that's one of the first assessments that all the, all the medical, uh, the community health volunteers are spending their time doing going door to door, doing measurements in children so we can kind of get an idea of the, the scenario that we're in. And I think the next couple of slides show examples of that. So this community or this particular area, the green slide was the World Health uh, data of under five um, on their body mass index curves. And the red one is this particular segment of this community. I think there's a couple of these graphs, maybe even the next one, maybe even the next one. Um, yeah, essentially all this is showing is that this community has a lot of stunting and malnutrition in it. They're, they're lagging behind on the, on the height weight uh, graphs from the rest of the children in, 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 in the country, and which is to be expected when you're dealing with this level of, of, of poverty. And so part of this is being what we've also been working on here is nutritional and, and um, assessment. So during this assessment, um, uh, 240 children under the age of five had to receive micronutrient supplements at the early childhood learning centers through the Malusi um, progr pro program here in December. Uh, next one. So part of this um, training as well was nutritional. Um, so 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 when you are in the bottom of the bottom of the bottom and in, in the poorest of the poor, you, you definitely don't have a lot of variety in your diet, and you can't afford it. Uh, so you're having a lack of protein, you're having a lack, lack of micronutrients. And so what you're eating a lot of is starch. And in, in, in the community there, they call it pop. You can imagine it being like a, um, a corn-based meal that kind of looks like a really, really stiff uh, malto meal. Um, and and that, that's kind of, that's just a stomach filler and that's what people eat. Unfortunately, the pop that they're often eating doesn't have a lot of um, uh, nutrients. So this is what we're doing is showing them how to take their core staple and mix it with vegetables and what they call a relish. It's a small picture, but if you can see the picture there in the pot, what's that being, what's being cooked in there is a bunch of vegetables and, and what'll be the relish on this, uh, as they call it, on this, um, this, this sadza or pop, this, this cornmeal based uh, product. So you can keep on going. I think we'll have other pictures of that. Um, yeah, then they actually came and do, they, they do, they have a kitchen there. So they're teaching the mothers actually how to prepare. A lot of these mothers have never been taught how to cook. They only know how to prepare what they know. And so this is something different. Uh, we'll go to the next one. Um, in this particular one, they were giving a whole balanced uh, diet. So they were given an example of a meal with eggs and, and a potato and, and, and rice dish as well. I think the next one has the training slide. Uh, yeah, this is just another picture of, of the pop-up. These, these classes go uh, multi-times a week, and they're talking about how to increase the protein of somebody's diet. Uh, there's, there's, there's certain vegetables uh, that are actually have a protein content. Uh, we're working with some of them here in Zimbabwe called the chaya tree, C-H-A-Y-A, not chia, but chaya. And uh, this particular uh, protein, this, this vegetable, or it's actually a tree, it's leaves, it's a bush, its leaves have uh, the serving of, of the same serving of protein that an egg would have, and it has six times as much vitamin A as spinach. So it's just a high, a high superfood, and, and we're working with that here in, in, in Zimbabwe. Uh, but they're using some other similar types of, of greens uh, there. Uh, 
I think the next one kind of shows the slide. So there you can see, um, actually that lady's hand is kind of covering it. There's the big rice dish or the, or the, the starch dish, which is what they're familiar with. And then this, uh, I think the next one may even have a better picture. Yeah, you can kind of see the green pot there. So you see the white one, which is all the starch. And then, and then they're showing them how to prepare a, a vegetable-based relish that would go with the starch that has the micronutrients that the children would be needing. And then, um, yeah, then there's also like a, some food relief going on where we're giving out meals. So we prepare a meal and then they're giving out the meal. Um, so you can see in this particular one, it's six eggs, two mealy meals, some green beans, potatoes, or tomatoes and onions. And then they've had that meal and now they're getting that meal to go and make at their own house. And these are kids, uh, they, got, they got some toys uh, donated by the Lions group. So that was nice that they came in and, and got this. And you can see kind of the buildings there that are under construction. They're, of course, we can't build on this site. So these are all temporary uh, centers. Um, but I think even the next picture shows a little bit better even. Um, okay, that, that's, that's another spot of, 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 of the interior of the building. But at least there's a place for the community to gather and, and where they can, we do can, can put some stores, storage there. But there are also other, other like lions and other, other groups are getting involved at this site now that there's buildings there, now that there's something other than just a tree to meet under. So I, I think it's kind of accomplishing what our goal was a whole time along was to, yes, we want a lot of Rotarians getting involved, but not just Rotarians. We want to bring the global and, and the local community together. I think the next picture has a, is a good one to show. Uh, that picture of the tarp there. Uh, so, that, so if you imagine, here's a place for kids to play with. Yes, it's not, ex it's not exotic, uh, but there are little buildings, little, little places for the community to meet, kids to play with there. Again, when we got there, I, I, I was just looking back at old photos. I mean, the first time I was there, there's nothing but an empty field and a tree. So um, yeah, all that would still be the same way unless our club had, had led the charge here and, and done this, uh, these, these two global grants. I think that's the last one, if I'm not mistaken, and I'm not sure if there's any time for a question and answer or, or all, but I know we have a busy agenda. And there's an example of the nutritional gardens being being uh, grown on site there now. Did I get it in the ten minutes? I'm not sure if I did or not, but I tried. Well, you, did, you did great, and uh, on that meeting and uh, the success that you've uh, had, and what Rotary brought to the people uh, is, is really uh, is really tremendous. Walk to the microphone. Okay, so I can't hear anybody. Is anybody talking right now? Yes. It's kind of garbled. I'm not sure what I'm, maybe, maybe there's, um, try it one more time. Yeah, one more. Uh, come over here, Jim. All right. I can hear Mary. Speak into my computer. <laughs> hey Jeremy, this is Jim Hufland. I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the uh, where the people come from that end up in these camps. Are they climate refugees, or what's caused them? Uh, you know, is, is, are they coming from war torn countries? Are they all from Zimbabwe, or, or um, well, what's the source of people there? Why, why do they end up there? Yeah, Jim, it's a good question, and and there's a lot of reasons. Um, for, for that, but a lot of them are migrants, people crossing the border, as they call border jumping. Uh, the, the surrounding countries around South Africa are, are as you would expect, uh, less economically uh, advanced. And so the people are looking for opportunities. In some cases like Zimbabwe, they're fleeing potentially um, sometimes political persecution. Sometimes it's um, um, just, just broken infrastructure where there are, there are no jobs, no income. And COVID has only accelerated that all around the world. Um, the lockdowns have been um, brutal. Uh, I think uh, uh, well, somebody said it best. They said the, 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 the rich fear the next, um, the, the next uh, variation of, of COVID and, and the poor fear the next lockdown. And I think that's the, that's the, the feeling globally 
um, they, they really get hurt um, by, 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 by that. It really constricts food, it, it rises food insecurity, it rises lack of education, it just, it, it just compounds its challenges. So all that to say is even, even in South Africa, there's people who have lost their homes, who are, who've lost their jobs, and now they're living in these camps. Chris Kennedy had a question about no water. Um, if there are communities with no water, how are we getting water to them? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, so I should rephrase that. There's no, um, there's no plumbing system. So the government does periodically bring in tanks and people fill up buckets of just simple plastic buckets for water. Um, and it's again, it's a, it's a, it's a, frustrating position because you they, the, the the land is is disputed um as you can imagine some some land especially land issues here in zimbabwe there's a lot of disputes about who owns the land um, who does it rightfully title and belong to so these tracts of land are kind of those disputed areas and so nobody can really lay claim we, we as rotary as rotarians we couldn't build any permanent infrastructure or sponsor any permanent infrastructure on there it all had to be temporary um, and yet, when you look at it realistically, that community has been there for decades and doesn't seem to be going anywhere because nobody would figure out how to house 80,000 people anywhere else. So it's a frustrating um, world, um, especially for them. One more question that came up is, how are people being vaccinated against COVID? Mm -hmm. They are. Um, in fact, I think they just, they just had an announcement in this report of how many, they just did a pop-up and I believe they vaccinated in one day um, 57 patients, was that what it was? Maybe it was 93 patients that were vaccinated. I believe that's what it was. So they, they I mean, they are getting vaccinations out to people um, and, 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 and Rotary's been playing a part in that as well. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. Uh, thanks, you guys. I really miss everybody there and uh, wish you well and wish my greetings. And uh, I'm going to be trying to come back um, a few times this year. So if I do, I'll definitely try to make it on a Tuesday so I can uh, say hi to y'all. Great. Uh, I forgot one thing. Very happy about John Silver has got a reason to be happy. Great. 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 News. So, uh, congratulations. All right. Uh, everybody knows we've got community service event uh, in about 25 minutes. So, we'll uh, keep rolling here. But we had 25 to 27 people registered. So, that's tremendous. Uh, Mary? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, turn on your video. All right. Well, half my brain is just thinking about this stuff and half my brain with you. So Tuesdays are a challenging day for me. But anyway. Um, and the other thing is, I do apologize for this first voice. I'm actually going to go, uh, many of you know I had surgery in November, and right there, which is on my voice box. And so my voice is not recovering, so go get some help with that. Um, if you were here, you would come on stage. Uh, a couple of people I want to identify in the room, uh, we introduced. Vince, as, uh, as a guest this morning, I want to acknowledge David Johnson is here. David, Dr. David Johnson is a chiropractor, and um, he is, uh, his practice is in uh, a space uh, where Casey Moore was, if you remember Casey Moore. Casey moved from this area, and David uh, came in and took over his practice. Another guest with us this morning is Kate Agnew. Kate is, um, her toe is partway in the water um, testing out uh, a run for city council. There's a city council election this fall of 2022. So her name might be on the ballot. So please feel free to reach out to Kate and, uh, and, uh, and get to know her. 
And it is my pleasure to introduce the gentleman to my left, Peter Dinovic. Uh, I met Peter, and when I was on city council, Jim was on city council, and we were looking for options for what to do with 49th and a half street. Um, the majority of that was city owned. And uh, and the rest of it was this closed business or that business that didn't really have a vibrant front door. And so I'm uh, looking for what could happen to that. And uh, idea came across. I think we had five ideas, and it was <laughs> one, two, three, four, five. And this, I said, can can we really have this? And now we have. It. Um, so we we have the, the creative minds uh, like Peter and the partners that he brought to that project to thank for uh, Nola Main and the vibrancy that is now Market Street. So a little bit about Peter. And there's a house on 44th Street uh, that is right it's right at uh, he spent 10 years with Carvel Investors, uh, and uh, when he was there, he was the youngest promoted director of real estate, and he created an investment firm with uh, $10 million in assets that continues to grow annually, and part of his work uh, today, and so he gets as much time as possible, is to really pursue the potential of of place of taking areas that are currently underutilized or um, better utilized and um, bringing some creative use and ideas to them. So, without further ado, Peter. Thank you. So, your presentation is there. And I'm going to move that little box out of the way. All right. Mm -hmm. Started it about uh, eight years ago now, um, and you know, as a side, really focused for enriched experience. Um, kind of leans into some of the, the rotary, uh, really orientation around goodwill and, and, and friendship. And I'm excited to be here. Um, the first question that often comes up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So all this is so one of the questions that comes up is that and how did we do what what we did? And so um, you know what you what you'll see is that we really uh you know, we have focused on. You have an um, arrow on your computer. Well, I don't know. No. Nope. All right. Perfect. Move around to the camera. We focus a lot on how to. We're different than I think what you find in the pattern is that it's magnet for cash, right? And, and our firm dealing with the country is, is one that tries to do that. We've really earnestly kind of looked at how we can do that. How we can do that in a relatively quick pace to go out and raise our some of our. Uh, Enduring values, things that, that drive the outcomes we hope to achieve. But what's at the heart of it 
you're going to find that we aren't like many other developers. We don't have pension plans that are working in the background to say you have to sell or you have to hold things for three to five years and then and then get out. We have an ability to, to stay for longer than might be um, might be typical, and that allows us to come up with things that are innovative. That, that's that's what that dictates the trends, and that's what I think we're seeing in the city and the district as we continue to um, push forward with, with the vision. Um, each of the deals that we do is with what we've done about a quarter of a million in, in the short time that we've, uh, we've been around. We've we really focus on about five deals a year. So the communities that we work in get our direct attention, get our direct attention. And I think that matters as we look to achieve outcomes. Um, so, you know, what, is, what does the future look like? And I'm just going to give you kind of a brief overview. You know, we are, we are not apartment specialists. We, we're not retail specialists. We look to do, again, just a few deals and we buy complex we're really just trying to bring the deals a lot more into um, this is important because it is going to want to give um, firms a lot of access to not only management money but also to loans and, and it was a team effort um, and ultimately it was something that we were able to model after many other places in the country across the country so it's, it's, it, it can be informative as we look to the future and what what is next for for 50th and Frank. but to start at the beginning you know this is a slide that actually uh, showed up at um within the city of Twin Cities as we started to look at what does wayfinding look like how do we get in a spot of uh um uh of really improving the quality of life and you can see this is the the right our market space when we were entering the city process it was uh, a parking ramp that um, had been word of a, a number of repairs but was was chipping away at the, at the expansion joints and non ADA compliant and you could see that on the north side there was a significant parking ramp but and that's important because you know when we you know think of all of the old things that we have to do and and think about with our with our families and what we've been around us is it's so many years ago that we have to do that and we have to do that and that's the reality of what our city is trying to do um on market street the city and the vision was our to be in twenty seventeen we were awarded that our the one of the And, and what I find to be kind of a, a fun example of uh, really the, the earnest pursuit of a better outcome are the images that you see on the right. And I say that because the one at the top, in the very top corner, was what was originally shown in the RFP design. The, the photo in the center was kind of midway through the, the, the city process, and the one at the bottom, which is kind of hidden by uh, my uh, is, is what ended up happening, and and I think what's great about that is, you know, throughout this process, we've been working to try and improve the outcome, and and as a result, I think we've we really landed at the better spot. So again, you know, this is this is a byproduct of our trying to recreate what we see elsewhere in an environment that enhances our. Of wider arena of Brentwood Country Park of, of the places that across the nation embody these community <laughs> gathering areas that mix retail and, and commerce in a way that doesn't exist adequately in the city at scale. And so when we look at kind of what we've endeavored to do throughout this process, then imagining that space because it's 
the taking those examples and carrying them forward. And what's fascinating is the kids taking those examples is also our ability to, to meet the community to, to drive outcomes was not perfect at the outset. In fact, the slide on the on the right was one that came out of the uh, council presentation. You can see that we talked to we have a third, a third of the region. There's a region, 32,000 square feet, a third of it would be office or anchor tenant, a third of it would be teaching that was a full of of uh Edina at the time in France, and a third would be We don't have all of that. That was important because we wanted to see the public that we had in the right? we, we instead have 40 We went out and saw individual entrepreneurs. Uh, if, if you look at it, it progressed to an experience where you want to be known when you walk in. So if you go to 15th and Prince today, you're going to be impressed with shop owners that are in the store that in the second time, they know your name, or they know your attorney, or they know what you might be looking for, your family, or all those sorts of things. And so that truly was one of the important elements of, of reestablishing the community. The other 40% is restaurants, you know, and, and that's about trying to drive those hours of operation and that experience and that gathering for those shared experiences. So fascinatingly enough, we went from anticipating we only have seven to nine tenants to having 20. What we learned in the process is that when we think about the spaces, and I'm going to I'm going to introduce Bree's back real quick. When we think about the spaces, you know, the big block on the on the right, just below the, the green dot, that's about nine thousand square feet. We had only done seven to nine spaces. What you'd end up Doors that access that space, you just breeze past. You wouldn't want to encounter or interact with that walkway. And our goal was to create opportunities for interaction. Our goal was to surprise and delight and to drive people around the corner in a way that they want to continue to linger at 15th and Prince. And so what you'll find is that when you walk down there, the space from the Trying to do a pointer? I'm trying to do a pointer. Uh, the space over to the, to the left here now holds seven. There's a reason to walk around. You, you interact with, with storefronts and shop owners that you wouldn't have otherwise. If that were what was left side, it would only be two tenants. Um, so this is an example of the merchant energy space. You know, in the, at the top center, you got a person who was a sculptor who we ended up sourcing from uh, an online shop. On the right, we got a couple of, you know, lower right, we ended up testing out a flower truck, not particularly part of the plan, but a way to drive traffic down to the down to the plaza. Um, and as we I think what we've encountered is these communities are communities. And we, when we embrace them, we really need to embrace the, the shop owner as well. So for us, that is an actual going out and acquiring additional property. So the two areas, well, first of all, the, the red dashed area is the central space. The two green boxes represent buildings that we've since acquired after going through the Nolan Mains project on the basis that we wanted to protect those communities that, that have, have made a commitment to us. Right? So what you saw is one person's success with these eyelashes resulted in six eyelash stores opening at, opening at 50 in France. And so instead of a corn or four ice cream stores, our goal has been to create and sort the best of Product categories, and then let's try and make sure that they have the most value and uh, in that category. Uh, we're actually under contract with two other buildings down here, which will help to even further enhance that uh, that experience. 
this is that so our orientation here, and I know I'm probably uh, where I am. Our orientation here is all about the fact that one of those, one of the real thoughts, one of the things that we really wanted to reimagine was the belt. First row 50 yard line and had really done little along that walkway to create an experience, to create a block that you want to linger within. And I'm excited to announce to the uh, community that on the front, we're actually near the completion of uh, an entire facade redo. You can see how this looks. We're, we're, we're working through a process that will ultimately create usable space. And most will look at this and say, all right, well, that, that was the old barber shop down in that 660 square feet down in the basement. Now, we're creating a, a really remarkable museum of uh, retail space on the front that will be home of a very uh, a clothing store uh, to help us to uh, uh, make furniture. So we're, we're bringing in unique retail driving a pedestrian experience that now is enhanced and reflective of the broader district. Um, the storefronts along this walkway, if you walk down there today, you'll see Centene, which is, again, Jen owns the shop and she imports perfumes, Fairwell Woolen Mills, and uh, you know, owned by a bunch of Edina natives. Uh, Kate at, shop, or, uh, at Harriet and Alice has expanded. And then the, the top name, so for us, you know, I think this is this is where within our community, the goal is to kind of work together to find that that they feel like they bring goodwill, that they bring everyone to the table, and and there's no type of place. And so when we look back on our experience, we look at kind of what what the future looks. Means we continue to test. We continue to evaluate how the actions we're taking uh, are reflected in positive or negative ways. Um, we've seen that in some of the, the overall events that we're, we're going to continue to support music in the plaza as an event that was a success uh, last year. Um, we will continue to lean into certain unique tenants that, you know. Like Nancy Chain, who moved from a Galleria uh, in Sydney to and just lead into that. And we saw, you know, sales and Jackson Taylor and Hubert White work what they need. And I think that's the disconnect in retail today. That's the future is landlords also saying, what does this mean for me? How can I be a part or a partner and a part of their success? Look at our, our go forward is you know, we've, we've tossed the playbook out for what retail is and we've kind of threaded the needle in that direction and, uh, and opted to collaborate with those. So I'm excited to know that you know we're seeing traffic patterns that are, are up to pre pandemic levels. Um, I see that the movie theater is opening uh, thanks to the collaborative kind of community focus that the city has taken. Um, uh, and uh, so I guess with that, I'll turn it back to you. I'll, I'll essentially answer your question. Yeah. Is there, uh, have you got any plans for a shared office workspace down there, which is becoming a trend? Across the state. Yeah, so we were, um, I was not in the office when we were going through um, the city process. What we observed in Caribou was that it, Kind of served as a backup shared workspace. There was the same group that tried to open at the ground level that we call Harris, uh, right in the same spirit of that shared workspace. Um, I don't know that it is yet, but we're actually in discussion with the architectural uh, ability building to actually get to the grandson on the yeah. outside. You know, at this point, we're we're down to the final. 
barring any any expansion of buildings or reimagination. Yeah, so this, so this is what, you know, this isn't, we're living in the era of death, right? And so what we're finding is that all of that on the site. And so <laughs> this is an example of something that we were able to get from from recent studies in third party settings. It shows, you know, where are the folks going to 50 at this time. And what's what's interesting, I mean, you can roll out and, and see broader Twin Cities. What's interesting is that Santa has one thing. So one of the things that happened is that if you didn't have some of the community engagement, you would find that ties it. You would find yourself out of contention for That's why places like Galleria or the malls are incumbents, right? They 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 have a sense of historical data that's difficult to disrupt. And so some of this some of this admittedly altruistically as much as like if we can have all these engagement, these national towns can say yes, you know, Orbis, for instance. 50 of the France is the top market for us on online sales. They locate that. It, it's this type of data that, that you know, the question is one, is that data driven by cell phones? Yeah. yeah. Okay, and two is, uh, is there a trend, you know, city center services are declining in the last three years? Uh, we obviously see it. Are we recognizing a trend to move to these more um, outskirt areas? Areas that help developers. Uh, in a retail context or in a hotel? Yeah, no, in a retail context. Um, I, you know, I would say that our, our nearest competition today is actually the North Shore. So I don't know that that's I mean, it's a little bit tricky because it, it requires kind of like a market by market evaluation, like brand by brand. Folks that we're looking at from out of state. That would make a point for us to come to local Twin Cities are doing stuff called evaluation. I think from that standpoint, it's difficult to, to replicate the data, nor do we really care to. Any time it is, it is the density, right? The amount of tension, whether good, bad, or indifferent, that's something that I think we still work really hard to try to do. Very good point. And do we, do we have to this? Can we just feel through that? Sure, let's unshare. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, if I, I guess it's just explicitly based on policy. If there's a, you know, and this is an example, the beauty of not doing a bunch of deals is you can, you can go into different situations like Logan Hall. I literally went in with, with well, there, I'll be your I'll be your sous chef for today. Let's just talk. I'll chop and pocket. And so someone else ended up landing at 50 of the grants. Similarly, Mr. Paul, you know, Tommy was the executive chef at Butcher and Gore for for many years in Virginia. And, um, and you know, they had a eight million dollar sale in this restaurant. Tommy wanted to. Um, Kind of find his own uh, restaurant. He ended up meeting with the actually the owner Josh Brown, who I had worked on here, built a home on the Bellison building and the Bellison clothing line. He got to meet with Tommy. So we meet with Tommy eighteen months ago. Have that meeting. Roll on. This is just a quick slideshow. Um, 
maybe maybe there's some uh, I'll keep talking. Yeah, so, yep. so we've been doing public timing and you know part of the deal there is you, you, you make this you folks that you want to have shared success with it. and um, it was one of those ones. What we ended up doing was structuring a lease that was very atypical within the world of cities. And I think you know you, you have some shared alignment. So what we're doing uh, in fact on March 1st. Tuesday, they're supposed to have some big New Orleans brass band in the, in the plaza, and um, but they're 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 the darling, uh, certainly the process. Uh, there we go. Thank you very much. Club, and we will give a, a gift to our foundation on behalf of you being here and uh, help continue doing the uh, good work in the community and we appreciate your uh, continued efforts. All right, so right there now, Elizabeth, you're gonna take over, do you need the mic? Sure.